there were these complicated and somewhat confusing legal issues that the Portland Police Association was raising in its motion to intervene. And um, shortly after that, the AMAC also filed a motion to intervene, arguing that they also had an interest in the outcome and of this settlement agreement and how it was impacting communities in Portland. And, and they wanted to have a voice in this process and in this litigation. In February of 2013, a few days later, um, Judge Michael Simon, who's the district court judge who was assigned to the case when it was filed by the, by the DOJ, um, issued a ruling on both the Portland Police Association's motion to intervene and the AMAC's motion to intervene. And that ruling was <laughs> that the Portland Police Association could intervene into the case because they had an interest unique from the city's interest and the DOJ's interest in the case, but that the AMAC legally did not have an interest in the case that was separate from the Department of Justice. At least that's how the judge saw it. We argued differently. Um, and, but to the court's credit, the court did give, make up a special uh, definition and title for the AMAC in this case, one that I haven't heard of, have you? <laughs> um, and, and that was uh, enhanced amicus status. So um, amicus or an amicus curiae um, Trans literally translates to friend of the court. And normally it's something we see where, um, you know, an organization or a group that represents a, a, a particular individuals might file a brief in a case with their opinion or view um, of, of how the case should come out or the impact on people in the community. Um, and, but they don't really have a whole lot more uh, involvement in the case than maybe filing a brief, maybe showing up at a hearing. Um, and so what the judge did here was he uh, specifically laid out the um, role that the AMAC would be allowed to play in this case and uh, allowed the AMAC to uh, participate in briefing on all issues in the case, to attend hearings, to attend mediation, um, to uh, participate in oral arguments to the same extent as the parties. And this is a pretty significant role to give a community organization in a lawsuit. So um, it's, it was no small matter, as he said, the AMAC will have a seat at the table. And um, so that's a, a pretty big deal for the community, and it's something that um, we've been working throughout this process through years to try to um, facilitate more and more of the community engagement and to keep the community engaged because this is a very long and lengthy process and very complicated, um, and that community voice is so uh, important and critical. Also in 2013, a few months later, the parties, meaning the city of Portland, the federal government, the Portland Police Association, and the Albana Ministerial Alliance Coalition participated in a multi-day mediation um, with, a, with a mediator to try and resolve some of the objections, the specific objections that the Portland Police Association and the AMAC had made to the settlement agreement that was kind of prohibiting entry from going forward, the court from just entering in the settlement agreement and making it legally enforceable at that point. Um, and in November, after several days of mediation, both the, P the Portland Police Association and the PPA um, reached an agreement um, regarding their objections to resolve them and, and would agree to the entry of the um, uh, settlement agreement and they would deal with some of their other objections in a different way. And the AMAC also reached what we called a collaborative agreement with the city and the DOJ saying, we don't really agree with all the things in this settlement agreement, but we're not going to block and continue to object to entry. But we will still continue to um, advocate for parts that we think should be stronger and um, continue to work on what, what the AMAC saw as critical pieces of police oversight and accountability that were, they felt the settlement agreement did not go far enough. Um, and that was very um, specific and intentional because the DOJ and the city really wanted the community organization who now had enhanced amicus status to sign off on the settlement agreement and to give kind of the blessing to move forward. So I would say the AMAC gave kind of a mixed blessing of, you know, we're not gonna block this because there are important things, there are important aspects of this settlement agreement that need to be implemented, but we also think there's a lot more work that needs to be done.
And so um, the AMAC was very clear about about that position and, and has continued to advocate for many things that they think um, need to be corrected in the settlement agreement and beyond. Um, so in February of 2014, the court held a two-day fairness hearing. So has anybody ever participated in a fairness hearing or the one in this case? So when there is um, a significant, Bob, you're going to be the yes for all of these questions. So when there is um, the type of lawsuit that is brought and, and the um, settlement agreement is the type that, that was brought in this case, part of the procedural requirements is that the court hold what's called a fairness hearing so that members of the community at large can tell the court how they feel about it. Is it, and the question the court was seeking input on from the community was, was this settlement agreement fair, adequate, and reasonable? And so um, sometimes they take one day, sometimes they take two days. Here, um, it was a two-day hearing, and it was a very powerful hearing. Many, many people from the community um, testified about their personal experiences with Portland Police Bureau, about their hopes for oversight, about their hopes for accountability. Um, and, and it was, a, I think, a cathartic process for many people to be able to go to court to talk to a federal court judge who's overseeing the implementation of this agreement, who's going to weigh in and, and decide ultimately whether this agreement is, is appropriate in this case. And for, for people to speak directly to that judge, I think it was a very, um, Judge Simon did his best, I believe. The court did a really good job of making it accessible to people. Um, the court allowed people to submit testimony by video if they couldn't show up um, and provide for alternate formats or written, submit written testimony as well and try to really make sure that people felt comfortable weighing in on this issue. And, and the court represented to everybody that, that the judge in the case read every piece of information and watched every video that was submitted, which I think is significant. Um, and should be the standard, but I just don't know that it is. So it was, it was um, a lot of people felt, took a lot of comfort that they were being heard in a lot of different forums, not just through the AMAC, not just through the city channels, not just through the Department of Justice channels, but could speak also directly to the court on these issues. Um, in March of 2014, the Portland Police Bureau shot and killed Kelly Vern Swoboda. In June of 2014, um, the police shot and killed Nicholas Glendon Davis. 23-year-old houseless individual. And on um, August 29th of 2014, Judge Simon accepted the settlement agreement, um, but he added a little tweak to it. He found that the settlement agreement was fair, adequate, and reasonable as su in substance, but procedurally, because of what he had heard at the fairness hearing, he went a little bit further. So I brought a copy of the settlement agreement with me, in case anybody wants to look at it. It's also available online. It's uh, 77 pages long, 190 paragraphs. It's quite the beast. And um, it's, it's very detailed with timelines and um, very a lot of specifics on, on what the police have to do. And uh, it, it covers a lot of different areas. Um, the, the main topics in the settlement agreement are use of force, training, community-based mental health services, crisis intervention, uh, an employee information system, which is to, to track uh, data and information, officer accountability, and then the community engagement and creation of a COAB, which is the Community Oversight Advisory Board. So um, it's, it's a very elaborate um, agreement. And um, the, the wrinkle that the judge introduced into the agreement was that the parties would have to come back once a year to the courtroom and present on their progress on implementing the settlement agreement. Now, the settlement agreement is supposed to be implemented within five years, um, as we're going to find out that's we're at the five-year mark almost and um, we're not close or they're not close I should say um, so uh, that kind of raised uh, some issues with the city so part of what Judge Simon ordered was that there would be what's called an evidentiary hearing and so for lawyers in the room probably recognize but for others it means that that people would be called on the stand and present evidence to the court this was not something that was in the agreement but it's certainly our position that that's fully within the authority of a district court, a federal court judge to order information to be presented to the court about 
um, an agreement that he's oversighting, has oversight of. Um, and so he ordered that to happen and, and start in September of 2015, so a year from the date that he entered the agreement. Um, and a month or so later, the city of Portland chose to appeal that ruling because they argued that the court did not have the legal authority to order the parties back to court and present evidence on um, uh, compliance or non-compliance or the status of that. That was very confusing to many of us because the city was saying, we've already done most of this stuff. So if that was the case, we wondered, well, what's the problem then going to court and telling people about that? Um, so the city appealed it, and that once an appeal is filed, it, it kind of stops the proceedings while, the, while it's resolved on appeal in the Ninth Circuit in federal court. So um, that kind of paused everything for a while, and that was back in October of 2014. Um, despite the appeal, the city and DOJ kept moving on with implementation. So the city hired... Um, Part of the agreement, there was the COAB, the Community Oversight Advisory Board. There was also this position called the COCL, the Community Oversight Community Liaison. Those two were to be kind of melded in a certain way. Um, and the AMAC participated in the selection process in the sense that gave recommendations of several folks or groups that were um, seeking to get that contract for the COCL position, which would do kind of data analysis and a lot of the technical pieces of the oversight process with the agreement. Um, the AMAC and several other groups made a recommendation of who they thought should get the contract. The city hired a different group um, out of Chicago that didn't have a Portland community-based tie. They eventually hired ju former Justice De Chief Justice DeMunez from the Oregon Supreme Court as their kind of um, local anchor. Um, and the, the city went ahead and, and awarded them the contract for $315,000 per year for the five-year anticipated contract term. In November, um, Portland Police Bureau hired additional people, um, data, data analysis, and, and made plans to hire a mental health specialist um, to help develop those community relationships and work with the, the um, COCOL group, the Rosenbaum group. In February of 2015, this community oversight board started meeting. Um, it was about 20 people or so from the community um, who were tasked with seeing with oversight of implementation of the agreement. Um, in March of 2015, Judge Demunez had taken the role of kind of chair of the community oversight board, working with the community liaison, the COCL group, and they cited the office inside a precinct which many people in the inside a police precinct and many people in the community reacted very strongly to that because here you have um, somebody who's supposed to be liaison with the community who is impacted by um, these allegations of excessive force by the police bureau and they cited um, the office of this person who's to engage with the community in a police department which felt um, that it didn't take into account that most people are going to be fearful about engaging with um, a community-based um, organizer if, if that they have to go through a police precinct to, to have those engagements. So there was a lot of criticism on that, and they um, also relied on the city, who's the defendant in this case, to administer, provide a lot of the administrative support, and that also struck people a lot um, it, as kind of not the appropriate way to handle this the perception was that if this person, if this organization is in collusion with the defendant in this case, they're not going to be somebody that people trust going to and trust with their stories and feeling vulnerable and trying to engage with with um, th this organization when trying to talk about police reform. Um, and in March also of 2015, police shot and killed Christopher Ryan Healy, a 36-year-old houseless person. In April of 2015, Judge Demunez resigned as the Portland representative, and Kathleen Sadat, a local activist, um, very well respected, steps into that position in May of 2015. Um, in June of 2015, police shot and killed 29-year-old Alan Lee Bellew. In July of 2015, both parties to the U.S. Um, so, meanwhile, all this is going on, and the the Ninth Circuit appeal is um, still pending. And as part of that appeal, there's a Ninth Circuit mediation process that all the parties participated in. And as a result of that mediation process, the parties submitted a proposed order to Judge Simon that was modified, that took away this evidentiary role of the court. So it didn't say, Judge Simon's original order said, 
produce evidence and, and, and testify. So the modified order that the parties reached said no evidentiary hearing, um, but the court can a- the, the parties can can talk about status and the court can ask questions. And then and a key part of that was that the community oversight advisory board, this community oversight board that was created out of the co- of the settlement agreement, would self-select somebody from their own group to also talk to the court about the status of implementation and the COAB's perspective. And again, that was significant, at least to the AMAC, right, because it brought a community voice into the process. So the AMAC was going to be able to talk to the court. The DOJ could talk to the court. Um, The city can talk to the court. The Portland Police Association could talk to the court. But this actually was a direct line to those who were engaged, community members who were engaged in the oversight process. Um, So so that we saw as um, a significant part of this. In August of 2015, um, the city voted to increase Rosenbaum and Watson's contract, that's the COCL group, from 315000 a year to $458,000 a year. In November of 2015, Portland Police... Did I get the right? Oh, okay, I, and I skipped the... Um, so in September of 2015 was the first annual status conference. And that was what was agreed to is the settlement agreement where we'd all go to court and report on how the progress is being made on implementation of the settlement agreement. So the Department of Justice wrote their report on um, what they felt like had been complied with so far and very detailed line by line um, indicating whether there was some compliance, no compliance. Um, And so at that point, we were, let's see, two years in to um, the settlement agreement uh, implementation or technically one year. Um, (laughs) And uh, the Department of Justice found that the city had partially complied with a number of the specifics in the settlement agreement, um, but no full compliance on any of them and no full compliance on any one of those areas um, or even partial compliance on any complete one of those areas. Uh, Interestingly, that first year, the community oversight board piece was not reported on uh, by the Department of Justice. Um, it, they just didn't even measure whether there had been any progress there. Uh, at that point, there had already been some turnover on the Community uh, Oversight Board, and the Department of Justice had asked the city for a proposal on how to fill the seats on the Community Oversight Board and, and um, how to improve that process. So we were already seeing some problems at that stage, but not, no real solutions being offered. So in April of, fast forward a year, that was 2015, now we're finally in 2016, um, and the parties are continuing to work on these issues. The AMAC is continuing to engage with um, the Department of Justice and the city um, about these critical issues and continuing to engage with the community. Um, In April of 2016 is when then Chief O'Day um, resigned because of the shooting incident where he was, where he shot his friend on a hunting trip in June of 2016. Um, the COAB board chair at the time, Kathleen Sadat, resigned from her position. And several members of the COAB resigned as well. And so who here had followed any of those stories that were reported about the the issues that were going on with the COAB? So there was a lot of disruptions, right, that were going on during these meetings. Um, A lot of people have different opinions on why that happened and how it should be addressed. But I think it is significant that, um, you know, there was concerns from from many members of the community about engaging with the community oversight board. There were many concerns with the community oversight board itself. Um, The COAB as an entity issued many recommendations to the DOJ and the city about how they, about implementation of this settlement agreement. Um, And those, many of those recommendations, you know, at this point you'll hear a little bit later that the COAB is no longer active, Um, but a lot of, people put in a lot of time and effort and, and thoughtfulness into those, um, into those um, recommendations. And that's something that, that is worth a, a further conversation. Um, in August of 2016, the DOJ and the city agreed over the AMAC's objection um, to suspend all COCL and COAB functions for 60 days because of these disruptions and because they were trying to get some breathing room to figure it out. The AMAC's concerns. I want to point out that I think there there are a lot of different opinions on on 
some of the troubles that the COAB had. But I think there's pretty wide agreement that the COAB was, was not very well trained, that they did not have enough resources, that they did not have the administrative support that they needed, and that there really wasn't a lot of good direction on exactly how they were to be spending their time and, and what outcomes they were supposed to achieve. So it's a pretty big group of people from all different parts of the community and all different levels of experience and education and um, you know, great, great resources tons to offer, but you need some direction with any group that big. And so I think that we can all um, agree that that was one of the, the major failings of that initial COAB. Um, and so, so the city wanted to, and, and was successful in getting a 60-day hiatus where the COAB just stopped meeting altogether um, to try to craft a new COAB. The AMAC was very clear that we're not creating a whole new great system in 60 days. So let's go with what we've got and work on a system in the meantime um, so that we can continue to have community engagement and not have that interruption with the community. Um, and so the, uh, the AMAC uh, began meeting with the city um, and really working on how to address some of these issues, how to improve and make a better uh, COAB that, that was more um, productive and successful, and um, to keep the link, emphasizing always keeping the link with the community and keeping the community informed so that um, we didn't have the situation that we have now where we don't have a connection that is set up through the settlement agreement between um, the, the parties to the agreement and the, the community. So after that hiatus was approved by the Department of Justice, um, this was October, we're looking at October of 2016, and this is when the city negotiated a contract with the Portland Police Association, the police un union mid-contract, and incorporated one or two, um, or a few issues with the settlement agreement, but failed to address several other key issues with the settlement agreement and, and changes that members of the community um, um, that are, have been involved in police oversight had been pushing for for, for many, many, many years. And so um, I don't know if anybody was aware of that as well, um, but city council ended up reconvening upstairs behind a wall of police officers to approve that um, contract over the objection of many, many community members. Um, so and I and I raise that because I think that these are ongoing issues where we're continuing to engage and people are continuing to voice their opposition and opinion um, to how things are being handled, um, and yet it happens. Um, October of 2016 was the second annual status conference with Judge Simon, um, and during that status conference, so again the Department of Justice reported on um, where the city was in compliance and and where they were not. Um, there was uh, partial compliance in the use of force area, in training, um, in their employee information systems, and their officer accountability, and um, substantial compliance with a lot of the community-based mental health services. And so they did have some, some progress to report uh, at that hearing. However, there was a big red highlighted section in the community engagement um, an oversight piece, and uh, the Department of Justice found that the city was not in compliance with that piece uh, because the COAB was not functioning and um, there was no plan in place to, to make it so. Judge Simon heard from the parties and then opened up the floor essentially to community members who wanted to weigh in on their feelings on the, the status of the settlement agreement. Um, the hearing extended a little bit longer I think than most people had anticipated. And after, and, and because the COAB had been on this pause and there certainly the AMAC raised concerns, the representative from the community oversight board appeared and testified on an agreed statement that the cohab had agreed on and, and also raised concerns about this. So in response, Judge Simon said, well, let's come back in 30 days and we'll hear what's going on. Since you asked for additional time, I want to know what's I want to know what's happening. I want you to report back to me. So at the end of that, um, the, the, the court ordered the parties to come back in 30 days, essentially. And the city then filed what's called a writ of mandamus are asking the Ninth Circuit to say no the district court again Judge Simon does not have the authority to do this again we we believe that is not with legal support um, but it's certainly within the right of the city to to attempt that um, in December of 2016 so so that hearing in 30 days 
didn't go forward, right? Because the city had, had filed this writ of mandamus up to the Ninth Circuit about it. In addition, the city also asked for Judge Simon to be removed from the case. Um, and in December of 2016, Portland police shot and killed Stephen Wayne Leifel. In December, later in December of 2016, um, that was when the appeal or the writ, writ of mandamus was filed. And it's a, it's a pretty narrow issue about whether or not the judge could order the parties back again, again, about the, the scope of the court's authority. So even with that, um, the, the city and, and the DOJ and the court are still can continue to engage in, in the implementation of the agreement. In January of 2017, um, the COAB held its last meeting. And Mayor Wheeler at this point is now the mayor. He basically resigned all the members of the COAB um, including the ones who had offered to stay and help the next COAB board transition and, and provide that background and knowledge. Um, in February of 2017, um, Portland police shot and killed 17-year-old African-American Qantas Hayes. In March of 2017, the city and the DOG, DOJ agreed to mediate um, in the Ninth Circuit once you file an appeal or a writ, the Ninth Circuit tries to resolve the issues between the parties. And so the Ninth Circuit had offered to do that and that mediation is currently ongoing um, regarding the, DO, the, the city of, city's um, writ of mandamus for Judge Simon's order. Um, there's no plan as far as we know to reinstate the COAB. Um, and then most recently in May of 2017, Portland police shot and killed Terrell Kareem Johnson. Um, it here in Portland. So that brings us up to today. And, and the reason why we went through that extensive background is because it's been a long process and I think it's important to note that interspersed, there is still uses of force going on. There's still being use of force against um, predominantly those with mental health issues, um, community members of color, um, and why it's important to stay engaged in this process even though it can get tiresome. <laughs>